So let's start and uh, uh, first of all, welcome to everybody. Uh, we are very glad that you're joining our webinar. It's our first webinar actually. And uh, let me first say thank you to you. And uh, of course, uh, great thanks to our presenters. who will be uh, giving you quite some information today. It's quite packed. Uh, my role will be the moderator of this um, session, so I will be the person who guides you through uh, and hands over to the speakers. Um, the webinar series um, starts today and we have uh, roughly on a monthly basis uh, overall six webinars and you hopefully have seen the flyer. So we go through uh, the webinars from uh, today's basically talking more on the basics. Uh, uh, for the insect uh, industry um, and insects. And then we head on to rearing reproduction in the next webinar. We talk in another one on uh, processing, uh, so how to get to the end product. And uh, then there will be one on the, the costs and benefits and another one on how to approach and how to run the project. And we will finalize uh, with a webinar where we um, aggregate all our experts. Uh, and it's more a webinar on question and answers and, uh, and a panel where you can, uh, let's say, uh, get answers to questions you had during the webinar series, which have not yet been answered. So we can help you along. That's basically the rough road. Um, as you have seen, all of you are muted. So the only uh, possibility to communicate is through questions and answers. The question and answer sessions for those who are not uh, familiar with Teams, you will need to take a look on the top uh, bar in Teams and uh, there you will find the Q&A button. So activate the Q&A and uh, feel free during the presentations to ask some questions. Um, we have planned to have a, a slot for questions and answers at the end of the webinar and uh, we will definitely not be able to answer all the questions, but we will jump in some questions and we'll collect the questions and uh, provide some more answers on our website um, uh, after a couple of days so you can find uh, the questions and answers on our website. Um, <clears throat> another one quite important information the webinar will be recorded and we will um, provide you the link uh, to see the webinar in the recording uh, in a couple of days um, as well um, the presentation will be made available and you are free to use the presentation to share it in uh, with friends with network and other people interested in the insect industry so that's it um let's just get started and uh, get right into it and uh, give you an overview about what we will be talking today um, we will start um, on a short presentation on interconnect on us and then we will head on uh, on basic introductions on insects and their biology done by fabiola and uh, in the next step, so you will get an overview of what actually are insects. Um, and then we jump into black soldier flies, uh, substrates and best practices um, um, explained by Heinrich Katz. And then we jump into mealworm. Um, we have two experts here, which is uh, Lucas and Marcel, who will be talking on that. And um, at the last step, uh, Arthur will present uh, the project approach and costs, uh, just a high level overview. And as said already, we will be dig into deeper uh, along in another specialized webinar on that. So today's presenters, uh, we have Fabiola Neitzel, and I have to say overall, all the presenters are not newbies. Uh, these are real experts that have been working in the industry for quite some time and are very much uh, focused and, 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 and delivering uh, business models. So uh, all of them are running uh, businesses uh, in the insect industry. So uh, this is not theory, this is practice. Uh, Fabiola Neitzel uh, is um, a biologist uh, and uh, she has been running and, and done, done a lot of research as well on the insect industry across uh, all kinds of species from black social flies to mealworm to cricket and so on and so on. And she's running actually a quite interesting business. 
um, um, which is about um, um, uh, sick worms um, to be used uh, for for animal feed and, and and things like that. But she will explain that later. Heinrich Katz is. Um, a long-term, let's say, I would almost say veteran in this industry, uh, Sparehat, uh, is one of the founders of EPIF, which is the, the European organization for the insect industry. Uh, he has done a lot of our research and development, and um, he is running his own business, Hermetia Barut GmbH, which is all about um, black soldier flies and uh, producing uh, animal food and, and feed um, for the market. Marcel Lipa and Lukas Hartmann both are co-founders from Seprico. Seprico is a, a company um, uh, focusing on mealworms and uh, services around and building their own farm. They will explain that later on as well. Uh, I know them since, I don't know, two years uh, almost now. Uh, I've been working closely together with them and um, I'm glad they are joining the round here um, in this webinar. Arthur Kühl is let's say my co-manager or co-md co-founder and we are running uh and to connect and myself um i'm coming actually uh from a totally different industry and my background is more in consulting uh project management and delivery large projects so that's roughly about the speakers um why are we and what is the basic idea behind and to connect I think the two days challenge is, is uh, that there is, uh, I think, a lot of information floating around and this is a hot topic in the press. I have seen some development, if I take a look in Germany, initially uh, very hyped in the press, a new source of, of proteins. Um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, there have been as well some critical voices coming up uh, and concerns. So, um, and I think um, the industry is, is still evolving, you know, evolving uh, from a regulatory side. I think Heinrich can tell a lot about because that's uh, where EPIF is as well focusing on to get um, the permissions and the regulator uh, to, to understand uh, what insects are and that they are good for, for, for uh, to use in, in animal and human food. Um, and uh, but there is still is still a, a learning curve to go through. I would say so. So you see a lot of startups, and uh, on the one side, small startups, and you see a lot, and some big startups. But overall, I think um, it's still uh, a bet on, on on profitability and long term success of the industry. Um, uh, I think a big challenge as well is, uh, and especially when we talk to customers, uh, on the one side, I think we are quite easy to, cal to calculate the costs to build an insect farm, but you know, uh, that is not enough. You need to understand as well the markets and the pricing to sell the products. And um, here, I think um, there is not too much transparency on the market pricing. And uh, what I experienced and what we experienced as well is uh, knowledge sharing can be improved. And we can see that uh, that people uh, who today's who are today's presenters are very open and willingness to share their expertise. And I think we can create value if we uh, instead of competing and everybody working in his own silo, um, that we can actually share uh, forces, share knowledge and uh, get uh, faster on track uh, to the to the best of everybody. And uh, last and not least, I think uh, as well um, to to make everything success successful, I think we need to have some certain quality standards and a certain, let's say, uh, stability in the quality, because uh, if we target large um, uh, food producers, animal feed producers, they will ask for large quantities on a regular basis uh, and, uh, of course, on a consistent quality. So I think that is another focus we need to take a, a look at. So that's uh, let's say the background, uh, and that's uh, where we come from. Um, as I said, we are a startup. We are founded. We have founded in in in, in 2022, um, with Arthur Kühl and myself being the management managing directors. And what we want to be, we want to be a B2B platform. So we are not targeting the consumers, and we want to focus on business. So our focus is clearly on the professionals in the insect industry. 
and uh, which is very important. We are not talking about just farms, rearing and things like that. We want to cover the whole end-to-end -end process. So our view and our scope is starting from the downstreams, uh, substrates, um, substrate producers um, who can provide substrates to the, to, to the insect farms. We talk about um, uh, reproduction, we talk about rearing, we talk about processing of the insects, and we talk about uh, as well, of course, uh, the end markets, meaning uh, from pet food to animal feed or human food. Uh, so we want to get all those players uh, to join forces on the network and, and, and get linked together so we can create some momentum. And I think um, as well, I th uh, one important factor is um, uh, to make everything sustainable. It does not make sense to transport a lot of stuff across the world. So that means as well that we need to get the players as well regionally together. Uh, so they can build end-to-end -end processes um, and, and uh, without uh, low, let's say, environmental impact and footprint. Our goal is, first of all, that we will provide the technical platform, and I will just talk about that uh, later on, um, to, to, to maintain this community. And um, very important for everybody, we are not a two-man show. Uh, our goal is not to to be always uh, on ourselves. We are open. We are an open platform. That means um, not only open in a sense that people can participate, but as well open uh, in the future if we have some strong players who want to be partner, who want to be either partner or even a shareholder in the company. We are open. Uh, to those people and um, so we get more momentum, we get more strength and more power to transmit it. Midterm, um, our vision is actually not only being a social network, but as well to provide uh, technical products, services and solutions. Um, amongst those um, are marketplaces or tools uh, that can be used and we already uh, have one tool now uh, planned, uh, some calculators which helps you to calculate uh, some quantities and, and, and costs and things like that. So we will be um, going forward. Um, one Another goal would be solution architectures. What do I mean with solution architectures? These are Let's say instead of reinventing the wheel is uh, developing with our partners solutions that you can just plug and play depending on the size of the farm you have and uh, on the insect species so you can move forward. So that's basically our mission. And um, I briefly talk about our new website. We have a website running since September and maybe some of you are already registered in the website. But we are doing currently a major overhaul of the website, and this is just a glimpse um, um, how it will look like. It will be really like, um, I would say, a LinkedIn for, for the insect industry. Uh, so you can uh, connect with other players on the, on the platform. You can register your company. Um, there is um, there will be an industry map may showing uh, which company is located where and which is the focus. Um, there will be a section uh, which talks about uh, events and webinars. So if you have planned uh, an event or webinar, let us know and we will bring it up so you get a, a bigger reach. And then, of course, we will have a um, a forum where people can discuss on various topics and um, so and share expertise and so on so on and then we will have a member only area which is more or less anything on value added content whether these are uh, trainings uh, webinar recordings white papers or tools so what's in it for you you can connect you can contribute and share, you can learn and leverage, meaning basically uh, get expertise from others. You can find customers, you can find business partners. As I said, we go across the whole value chain and hopefully accelerate your business and be successful. So where are we? Uh, the platform, we are more or less, um, as we say in, in Germany, uh, on the ramp to load. So if everything goes right, we will be live next week uh, by the end of the week. 
um, with some major testing and we will inform you as soon as we are live so you can get on the web uh, on, on the platform and register yourself um, of course you can already register on the existing platform all the, the the profiles will be moved to the new platform so nothing is going to be lost you don't have to wait um, so uh, and then of course I think we need to get everything living and that means uh, we need uh, you to to post to connect and and get and get some breath and fresh air in the in the in the, in the platform so it grows and uh, gets momentum um, you can as well as we had a section or we'll have plan to have a section on industry news so if you have important news uh, which you think uh, which is really important for everybody let us know in parallel of course you can post on your own uh, timeline uh, uh, any interesting news uh, like you know from linkedin and so on and if you have anything uh, important which can help others to to grow or under better understand white papers tools and things like that you are free to share it. just make sure you have the ip and uh, we can post it uh, without any problems and last and not least um, uh, we need some more muscle to be honest, uh, people who can spend at least a, a little bit of time to be a moderator on our forums, um, I would be really, really happy if you uh, volunteer, um, uh, either if you are an expert on certain topics, meaning, as I said, insect species, biology, processing, things like that, or and this is uh, one of our key goals, as we said, we want to be global. We want to have people and we are looking for people in the various continents and countries. Currently, we have a strong focus in Europe uh, and we need to have a stronger focus in the Americas, in Africa, in uh, Asia Pacific. So it would be really great if we have some ambassadors, people who want to 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 join forces and work more closely with us and become, uh, let's say, a, a closer member uh, of the team. And um, I, um, you will find the contact information at the end of the presentation. So if you're interested, I would be really, really, really happy if you join uh, the team. Yeah. So. Let's jump into the first presentation uh, and I hand over to Fabiola uh, to start presenting. Hello from my side. Good morning. It's my pleasure to give you a basic introduction on the topic of insects. I think those basics are very important to have a good uh, foundation on, for everything that comes later from the other speakers. So. My first question is, uh, you can think for yourself, how many insect species do you know? So actually, um, can we go to the next slide? Um, ben, will I tell you to go to the next slide? Or how does it work? Uh, no, no, I'm, 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 I flipped it already. Don't you see? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I just uh, tell you when, when to go to the next yeah. slide. All right, thank you. So as you can see here, their insects are actually very diverse. So the current numbers uh, suggest that there are more than one million species of insects, which means there are more species of insects than there are species of plants, other animals, bacteria, uh, algae, and so on together. So can you imagine that? Uh, and with this information, we kind of get an idea that insects are very diverse and, um, yeah, there's not uh, the insect. So I think currently in media, it's always insect, insect protein, but actually it's a very diverse group. And we will have a closer look on that now. Next slide, please. So first of all, Insects are very adaptive. They can be found in basically every habitat on our planet Earth. So maybe forests, grasslands, there's, there's uh, fresh water as well as salt water, and even in freezing temperatures, they can survive. Uh, please, please. And, uh, one slide back, please. Yeah. Sorry for that. 
So they can even be found in very extreme habitats like manure. And you can imagine manure being highly um, occupied by pathogens. So insects really adapted to every possible niche you can find. Thank you. Next slide, please. And this brings me to another common misunderstanding about insects. So if you follow the recent press, you get the impression that you can throw basically any organic matter onto those insects, which we already learned it's not like one insect, but they're very diverse and they will eat it. And that's for sure not the case. So first, it's very important to understand that insects are very specialized and they have, for example, different mouthpieces. So there are chewing mouth mouthpieces, there are piercing sucking mouthpieces, siphoning mouth mouthpieces and sponging mouthpieces. And you might already have an idea which belongs to which uh, well-known insect species. And Bernd, maybe you click a uh, couple of times since there are some pictures uh, coming. Thank you very much. So as diverse as the mouthpieces, I think there are even some more pictures. That's it, thank you. So as diverse as the mouthpieces are, as diverse is the, the nutrition of different insect species. So there are insects which uh, basically feed on a, very, a great variety of uh, possible feed substrates, like the famous black soldier fly. And this makes them very, um, very suitable for insect rearing. However, there are also insects that are highly specialized. And that, for example, the Bombyx uh, mori silkworm, which only feeds on mulberry leaf trees, and uh, mulberry tree leaves. So only one plant part of one specific plant. And in between that, you can see on this picture all kinds of feed sources and habits. So we have insects feeding on uh, wood, insects feeding on blood, insects feeding on flowers, everything you can imagine, even like the burying beetles um, feeding on dead animals. And it's not even only one way. So the insects are not e only eating, but they are also ejecting substances into their feed to pre-digest it outside of their body. So it's really very interesting what's going on there. And I think it's very important when you want to rear a specific species of insect to look into the feeding habit of this insect. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. So what are insects? So one main characteristic is they have three pair of legs. Can you please click three times? So one, two, three. And I think that's the easiest uh, feature to, yeah, to, to count the legs and then you, uh, it gives you a strong hint whether it's an insect or not. Uh, one more click, please. So basically, if, yeah, you can see here, these little fellows uh, do not have three legs. The spider has four pair of legs, so it's not an insect. And then centipede obviously also has much more legs, so also does not count to insect. Next slide, please. Yeah, additionally, insects uh, do not have a skeleton as we have but they have a titanous exoskeleton. So basically, their firm skin gives them their structure. Uh, next click, please. Thank you. And uh, yeah, not everything that is small and on the ground is an insect, obviously. So uh, the exoskeleton is not true for the uh, snake. So this is obviously also not an insect. Thank you. Uh, what is very distinctive about insects, they have um, three main body parts. Um, two more clicks, please. It's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And they can be found in every insect. 
And yeah, again, you cannot find this distinctive body part in an earthworm, so obviously not an insect. Yeah, insects also have antennae. And we go to the next slide, please. And usually they have two pair of wings, or in some cases, one pair of wings and one pair of halteria, which are like used to be wings. Thank you. Now you might think, okay, we got all this uh, characteristics, but how do they apply to the insects we know? So where does the silkworm have wings? Where does the black social fly larvae have like legs or antennae? Where does um, where does this apply to the um, uh, mealworm? Well, if we look in their adult stage, there we are. There you find all those features and also compound eyes, which are another characteristic of insects. And this topic brings us to the next slide, which is the metamorphosis of insects. And the two main forms of metamorphosis defined in insects is hemimetabolism and holometabolism, which applies to the insects that are commonly reared. In hemimetabolism, um, which is like a grasshopper and cricket, they fall into this group. Um, a tiny uh, nymph hatches from the egg, and this tiny nymph is much smaller than the adult, but basically looks very alike. And they mold several times and grow, and with their final mold, they get into adult stage where they have wings, and they are fertile and can reproduce. But they basically look like um, the same version, just in different sizes. And um, that's very different with holometabolism and holometabolism insects. They change their appearance drastically throughout their life. And uh, there are different examples of that, like beetles, flies, and in this case, uh, silkworms. And um, yeah, it's probably you're probably most aware of the uh, changes within the butterfly or moth fly. So they hatch as a teeny tiny uh, thick worm or it's the larval form. Actually, worm is not very specific since worms are not insects, but in this case, they are called thick worms. And they also mold and grow. And once they are on their full um, size, they pupate. In this case, they build a cocoon and the pupate inside. And eventually the moth will hatch and lay this can lay egg again and then the circle starts again. Next slide, please. Thank you. A short look on insect uh, pathology. So this is a really big field. And basically every pathogen that we know from human uh, pathology of pathogen group can also affect insects. And there are sometimes very specified and specialized uh, pathogens that only uh, infect one certain kind of, uh, one certain species of insects or a group um, of insects, but um, not all of them. And others um, are very um, common and can affect almost all insects. It's important to know that insects do have an immune system, obviously, but maybe we do not always think about it. So they have me mechanisms to defend themselves. However, um, there are viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites, and even other groups that can be, affect the health of insects. And we are still quite at the beginning uh, to diagnose and treat insect diseases. And of course, this is an issue for mass rearing, where we have uh, huge amounts of insects from the same species in one place. So actually, in Europe, uh, the um, 
animal doctors are um, which treat uh, who treat the, usually the pigs and cows and chickens are also responsible to treat insects. But as you can imagine, they are not trained well to do that. So I think one of the main uh, measurements insect virus rely on is hygiene, good hygiene in their uh, facilities, and to try to avoid bringing pathogens from outside into their rearing facilities. But I'm sure this topic will come up more often during this webinar series. Next slide, please. Yeah, what can we get from insects by revering them? So I think the main product uh, we are all familiar with is protein, also lipids, then the trust. The manure from the insects can also be used and becomes very valuable as a fertilizer. Uh, also, the chitin can be a very interesting product and what's still quite new but could also play an important role in the future are antimicrobial peptides. Next step, please. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, I will give you a short introduction of what I do with my company, Prombix. So we work with stickworms, as already mentioned, and we utilize byproducts of the silk industry. So at the point where the where you have the cocoon and the pupae inside, the cocoon is used to for zip production, and we use the pupae inside to process it to ingredients for animal uh, feed stuff, uh, and thereby utilize the byproduct. Yeah, this is how the, what the sigworm pupae look like in a dry form. And for example, we process them into a protein powder. We mechanically defat them, and then we get a protein powder with 80% fruit protein and 5% fat, which is a great ingredient for, for example, pet food. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, uh, if you have further questions or want to contact me, please uh, don't hesitate to write me an email or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiola. Um, very interesting. Even I learned some stuff, so <laughs> that's good. Um, uh, to everybody, uh, I just want to refer again that uh, you can ask questions on the Q&A section. Um, you just need to go up and activate question and answers. So far, uh, there were no questions, so I was wondering uh, whether you have questions or just uh, haven't found a way to raise the questions. Please click on the top bar, uh, the Q&A, and then you can ask questions, and we will try to cover that at the end of the session. Now, I'd like to hand over to um, Heinrich to talk about uh, black soldier flies, substrates, best practices, and future developments in the industry. <clears throat> so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, Amitia Barut, uh, uh, GmbH Limited. We are uh, uh, already established that uh, on in 2005. We were the first company in Europe uh, rearing black soldier fly. Next slide, please. Our Hamitia Barut uh, is a spin off from Katz Biotech uh, AG. We rear since 1992 insects and mites for biological pest control, uh, yeah, beneficial uh, insects and mites. And uh, yeah, we have now uh, a 30, we celebrated a 30 year um, anniversary last uh, October. From uh, the Hamitia spin-off, we got in 2020 the Bioeconomy Innovation Prize of, from the country of Baden-Württemberg. Next slide, please. We have um, four locations um, in Barut, as the name says, it's a, a small city uh, located 60 kilometers south of Berlin. There we have, um, yeah, greenhouses and uh, production 
uh, the, the total space there is 3,500 square meters greenhouse, uh, 1,000 square meter out of this greenhouse we use for the reproduction, the neonate um, uh, rearing, and we have uh, 1,500 square meter production where we do the mass rearing and the, um, the processing. We have uh, insect technology center, a scientific center as one lab at uh, Berlin directly with 10 scientists. We have master, bachelor uh, students, interns, and we sponsor a PhD thesis at the University of Gießen, actually. Uh, further, we have a uh, production site uh, at the um, uh, other uh, uh, yeah, portion of the city of Barut in Publitz with 5,500 square meter greenhouse. And we have an R&D site uh, on a farm with two cubes, 12 by 12 and five meters high. So next slide, please. So we are talking about insect biotechnology and uh, it's also called the yellow biotechnology maybe of the, the color of the lymph of the, the insects, of the blood of the insects uh, in parenthesis. This uh, name is, comes from Professor Andreas Wilczynskas from uh, Gießen. Um, now I, uh, in the following slides, I uh, want to give you some insights on the black soldier fly rearing. I thank Fabiola for the real uh, good introduction in insects. However, I have here a slide about the, the facts and uh, it's just a repetition. Yeah, uh, the, the class of animals with the most species, about one million described, the Fabiola 740,000. Some say 1.5 million, never counted this. Probably you need a lifetime to count. Estimates are that two um, million um, species are out there, maybe five million, uh, my friend uh, Arnold van Hoys. Um, from Wageningen uh, is uh, estimating this. So maybe there are a lot of uh, species, uh, a lot of um, insects out there, which might help us in insect biotechnology. So maybe we uh, should uh, go for a screening and um, look at it uh, and find better species than what we have on the table uh, right now. We focus on black soldier fly because we think that's actually for protein um, production. Uh, the best one, of course, mealworm is also uh, quite uh, quite well and uh, the, the race is not uh, finished uh, by now. Maybe there are out there much better uh, species or maybe species which are uh, more uh, specialized, let's say on manure, let's say on special uh, substrates, uh, waste management, uh, whatever. One example, uh, two of my employees, they are looking worldwide for a new species and I described more than 30 new ones. And one of these guys came back from the Amazonas, uh, from Brazil and brought back a larvae with 200 grams. Yeah, 200 grams, so you have a, a whole stick in your ring. So then you might think, oh yeah, let's uh, rear this 200 grams, that's high. Mm, however, it takes seven years until it um, um, has the, uh, arrived the 200 milligrams, at uh, the 200 grams, and then uh, pupates, and then later the, the buck uh, will, will hatch. So a black soldier fly, let's say 15 to 20 stays with 150, 200, to 200 milligrams is superior. Okay, uh, total weight of all insects is, uh, 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 please went back, uh, went, went slide back, just uh, the total weight of all insects, four times the weight of all other animals, including us, including mankind, and less than 1.1% one, uh, uh, 1 is dangerous uh, for people. Uh, famous uh, entomologist uh, found this house, his name is Bill Gates. Um, so he made a list of the most dangerous uh, insects and he uh, went into entomology. Also, he found out, uh, of course, that the most dangerous uh, animal is an insect. It's the um, uh, Anopheles fly, which transmits the malaria uh, uh, disease. And there are still 800,000 uh, uh, casualties each year. Okay, thanks. Uh, next slide now. So we 
talk with the, uh, the black soldier fly about the holometabolic life cycle. As Fabiola said, we have the four stages, uh, adult flies, uh, then egg, uh, larvae, pupae, and uh, uh, adult flies again. The black soldier flies, no pest insect. Uh, the adult fly does not um, um, feed in adult stage. They don't uh, eat anything anymore. Uh, and they have a wide um, variety of uh, substrates, which they can uh, degradate and convert. So uh, we uh, need to understand this enzymatic potential of this fly, of the larvae of this fly. Um, based on 88% prime matter, it's about 40% uh, protein, 35% uh, uh, fat. Depends a bit on, on the substrate and the, uh, the, the water uh, content. Energy content is already directed uh, on, on the, the, the feed you, let's say, if we uh, produce feed, uh, pig feed in that case, it's a uh, pig feed a kilojoule, more than 8,000 kilojoule per kilogram, which is quite uh, good. And uh, uh, we have some good minerals in there. So it's a very uh, uh, good uh, uh, composition what uh, we get. Uh, they're all <clears throat> uh, essential amino acids, a little bit uh, weak in methionine. Um, however, uh, if, if we start uh, rearing, I think in some years, we will also uh, increase the methionine. I don't think we can do that with feeding. Uh, I think that's uh, all the, <clears throat> it's um, almost clear that uh, um, amino acid uh, profile is uh, determined by genetics. Next, please. Here is the holometabolic life cycle. Up on the left-hand side, you see the fly cages, the, the love cages, uh, where the search for the mating partner takes place, the mating, the egg laying, the egg harvesting, egg hatching, young larvae growth, larvae growth, and uh, growth, and then the pre-pupae uh, stage, uh, where they normally get out of the substrates, the pupae, where the metamorphosis takes place, the hatching of the adult flies, flies and the um, life cycle starts again um, <clears throat> uh, from reproduction you have to really manage this this life cycle <clears throat> you have to control it <coughs> sorry uh, i have something to drink um yeah the parameters um for them for the mating importing light um humidity temperature uh, temperature ranges uh, uh, then uh, where are they laying the egg, the egg collecting, harvesting? The, the major uh, thing is from uh, get uh, when you harvest the egg to uh, to the hatching to get a real fit uh, neonates. So that's one of our core uh, competencies uh, to uh, really uh, get a good yield out of that and have a high quality uh neonates um for the mass rearing uh, so for this cycle we let about 10 percent of the the larvae l4 larvae stage uh complete uh, this uh, cycle 90 percent we go to larvae processing we kill them um we especially do that uh, with uh, with heat um of course, in the industry, people talk about uh, inactivating and devitalization. Um, however, we cannot slaughter insects by definition. However, they are alive and then they are uh, killed afterwards. And then we go into the feed uh, formulation. Um, so, uh, yeah, next slide, please. So here you see the, the, the fly cages, uh, about 50,000 flies, uh, and on the upper corners, the, the cardboards where we collect the eggs. Next, please. The mating, uh, the female uh, on the left-hand side is a little bit uh, bigger uh, than, than the male. Uh, so and the, the bigger females we have, the more uh, eggs they can uh, carry. Uh, it's about 500 eggs, uh, actually, what a female lays. Next. These are the eggs uh, collected in, in the cardboards uh, where we uh, 
uh, harvest it next. This uh, looks like dust or like eggs, but these are already neonates, very sensitive uh, animals. Uh, we actually have um, a collaboration with FreeSem, the Israel company, where we are able to put them on a suspension and um, we can store them for 14 days. Uh, we think that will give a boost to the industry because then we can uh, flatten the volatility of the reproduction cycle and also we can uh, decouple. Uh, we have a, a very good uh, quality uh, after uh, this uh, 14 days and they start to eat very fast and they get the bigger than the, the the, the neonates um, uh, when they are real normally one big advantage as well they are synchronized they are very well synchronized because uh, two to three hours uh, harvest is brought together in in one batch next slide please so after 20 days at um, let's say 20 to 25 degrees they look like this if we go to higher temperature we can achieve that already after 12 or 15 uh, days also a little bit depending on uh, the substrate next please this is my picture why insect uh, is such a good um, feed for farm for farmed animals so, uh, Sorry, I didn't put my <laughs> mobile off. Um, so this is a golf course. Uh, kind of hard to play golf on this. The left-hand side is a tee, the right-hand side is a green. Uh, so boar went over this and they were looking for um, uh, insects, for larvae. And uh, uh, on the right side is my brother. Uh, he has a PhD in, in entomology, and he uh, was asked what this uh, what was happening there. And he found a lot of larvae uh, in in the grass, in the in the soil. And uh, you know, a boar, this wild pig, has such a soft nose. And with this soft nose, it's digging in this tough grass and this tough soil and searching for for insects. That's for me the proof that um, insects are such uh, a good feed for pigs, for example. Next slide. So one topic today is uh, the frass and the feeding uh, substrate. Um, first uh, to the frass, uh, since um, yeah, summer 2021, uh, Europe was scattered with uh, each country had uh, different uh, legislation, different laws concerning the frass. Um, in uh, 2021, uh, EU, the European Commission, set the baseline standards uh, for processed insect frass. It has, this has the advantage we have now a level playing field, uh, common standards all over Europe. However, we have uh, some negative um, yeah, parameters there. Uh, we need now a heat treatment of 70 degrees C for at least 60 minutes. There are two downsides in this. First, of course, this is um, additional cost. You need uh, energy, uh, you need handling uh, for, for this an additional process step. And second, we lose some of the characteristics of the positive uh, effects of the frass. Uh, we, we see if we don't treat it with heat, there is microbiology which supports the roots of plants and, um, uh, and uh, improves the, um, the nutrition uh, at, at the, uh, the, the roots. Um, however, we have now um, a discussion line, a baseline, um, a starting point where we can where we can uh, discuss with the European uh, Commission and uh, try to get rid of a certain yeah um, leg legislation or, or at least in, improve it. For this, we need, of course, scientific uh, evidence, scientific research to convince the authorities in Brussels. Um, in the legislation, there is also now a definition for frass. It's a mixture of excrements derived from farmed insects, the feeding substrate, 
parts of farmed insects dead eggs and with a content of dead farm insects of not more than 5% in volume and not more than 3% in weight. So another parameter. Next slide, please. Um, the status of insect farming, uh, we uh, have the status that we are um, uh, farmed animals. So we are in farming, we are in agriculture. Um, uh, so uh, we are regulated by the animal uh, byproducts. And uh, according to the basic uh, treaty, of the uh, EU or the Annex One in this basic treaty, insect farming is mentioned as an agricultural activity, uh, and we are included there. Um, so, insect farming activities do fall under the scope of EU uh, agricultural rules, organic legislation, rural development programs, uh, under the CAP. Um, Ten sixty nine. 29 animal byproducts is um, um, not in favor of us in the insect industry because there is written um, uh, an animal reared for purposes of farmed animals, uh, a farmed animal, and for a farmed animal, you are only allowed to use approved uh, feeding stuff. And there are other re regulations for the substrates, the feeding stuff for the uh, for the insects. It's um, the regulation 767 uh, 2009 only be fed with safe feed. So we are prohibited to feed the uh, faces and uh, we have to separate digestive tract content. Then uh, it's uh, forbidden. Um, to use processed animal proteins. So the 999-2001 is the uh, BSE, TSE, so the met cow disease uh, legislation, bovine spongiforme um, uh, encephalopathy. Uh, there is written it's forbidden to feed processed animal uh, protein to farmed animals except uh, fish meal. Um, yeah, but uh, in the downstream, we uh, got the exemption or the addition to this 999 that uh, processed animal proteins derived from eight insects from this positive list where black soldier fly and silkworm uh, is is on uh, on this positive list are allowed to be fed to fish as a farmed animal to poultry and to um, pigs not to to cattle, not to, to cows. Uh, cows are vegan, we don't want that. So in the downstream, we are almost there. But in the upstream, what we are allowed uh, to, um, to feed to our insects is right now only uh, vegetarian, uh, vegan, uh, vegan products, dairy products, but not containing meat and fish. But uh, from IPVI uh, uh, close contact with the EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, and the Commission, and also from the, um, the general direction from from agriculture, they they put some pressure on the, the general direction of the, um, the con consumer safety to to release a certain other uh, substrate, and that. Uh, will be very helpful for us as an as an in industry. The 142 2011, uh, 2011 um, uh, prohibits right now the, the for uh, to feed insects for uh, for feed uh, uh, as substrate, uh, for example, catering waste, and excludes as well former foodstuffs containing meat and fish, so the leftovers from supermarkets. And there are other. Directives uh, on our website, you can uh, read them in detail. Okay, that all this legal stuff uh, is, is very <laughs> dry stuff, uh, very um, complicated. Uh, however, we have to get through to that to improve. Yeah, in uh, as I already said, uh, 2017, uh, there the insect pups were allowed to be fed for fish in aquafeed. 
And this has led to this 2021-1372, where we uh, got the um, approval for the pups in pig and poultry feed. So this is effective since uh, September 2021. Next, please. So the future developments outlook from my personal point of view, I'm open for discussion in that. And I saw uh, Hilde from, from Wageningen in the, in the audience. Uh, she is uh, especially looking in, in this uh, project, the Sassin chain, what uh, I'm making, uh, uh, is executing a research in um, uh, yeah, looking into possible business uh, models and what may be favorable. Next slide. Um, I see um, there is uh, are already examples out there. The A to Z, the fully integrated production. There is on site the reproduction, the breeding, the whole. Uh, so I'm I'm talking about black soldier fly. Huh? So that the whole whole metabolic life cycle, the larvae rearing, and then the processing, the product manufacturing. manufacturing right now there are these two major processes the dry process is the dry process in the wet process uh dry process um yeah as the name says you kill and dry and then you with um, a press um, a modified um, a screw press you separate oil and um, um, uh, fat, uh, also fat in, uh, in from from protein. Uh, there, the wet process, uh, you um, make a, a suspension and go through a three cylinder, uh, so with a centrifuge, you separate uh, the fat from the the protein. Uh, yeah, there are pros and cons for each uh, processes. We are very uh, happy with our dry process and we, we what we use there as the core. Um, machine com equipment is a uh, screw press from Reinhardt's. Um, this A to Z uh, production is highly automated. Uh, it has um, significant uh, uh, substrate uh, intake. So therefore there should be a substrate source in close distance and also cheap energy, energy should be available. Next slide. The segmented production, the decoupling, uh, uh, is separating these three steps, the, the reproduction uh, the, the, and then the, the breeding, the, the mass production and the uh, rearing and then the, the processing. The, it, the central reproduction uh, has, uh, needs the uh, special kills uh, know-how, especially in terms of biology. In, in terms of getting a high yield in in the, uh, uh, in the neonates hatching out of the eggs. And as I already said, uh, then the neonates uh, have to, uh, it has to be fast to put them on feet. However, um, if we go on our suspension together with FreeSem, we are able to, to store them for uh, several, uh, days for yeah, and we guarantee 14 days 90 percent uh, survival rate uh, and, and a very good uh, quality the decentralized rearing uh, is then you can send then the, the neonates to the place where the substrates are available where energy is available where you have some approval in in uh, germany some turkey farmers pig farmers go out of business they have already approvals for rearing pigs and for emissions and so on and there is a possibility to transfer these uh, permissions which uh, speeds up the whole uh, processes and yeah uh, uh, we think we can go uh, in in this uh, area uh, to convert pig or poultry uh, stables and uh, the farmer does not have to care about the reproduction uh, and uh, especially saving capex and opex for this reproduction and then i think uh, central processing is um, the the objective we can then go for 24 7 production and have uh, highly automated and dedicated equipment and get uh, a consistent quality out of it. Next slide, please. 
So there are hybrid models. Um, uh, some of these A to Z uh, production uh, um, companies, they um, detect that they have a high volatility in their reproduction. And um, therefore, they always need overproduction and they, they throw away a lot of uh, uh, neonates. Uh, they uh, reduce uh, their reproduction to 50, 60 uh, percent, 70 percent of their uh, of the um, capacity of the mass rearing and then compensate with the suspended neonates. Uh, and, and so they can reduce costs in in their in their reproduction and uh, still have full capacity uh, coverage in, in their uh, mass rearing. So there are all combinations uh, possible, um, dependent on local conditions and availabilities. And I am really curious what comes out of the sussing chain project of the of the work package one. Uh, uh, the, the questionnaires and the, the workshops uh, Hilde is uh, running. Okay, what we need uh, is the optimization of CapEx and OpEx to get the com uh, competitive prices for the products. So we are still a young industry. The best approach will survive. Maybe there are some uh, uh, parallel approaches depending on the local, um, you know, uh on the local situation and yeah we are looking forward to yeah to thrive next slide so today already insect farming uh, is a european business reality but i am yeah ask you all to um, come to the industry to um, put your emphasis on it and work motivated that we reach our our goals and yeah help to make the the world a little bit better insects only uh, won't uh, yeah uh, save the world but we can uh, yeah contribute and let's do the best way thanks a lot Thank you, Heinrich. Uh, very good insight. Uh, and uh, I think I have not been over promising that you are a real expert as well as like everybody. And I see a lot of claps of people. So thank you very much. And um, to everybody, um, we still need to get more questions and answers. Please don't post in the queue, uh, the, 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 the chat session. Please post your questions in the Q&A session because this is what I will be using for the Q&A session. So I will hand over to Lucas and Marcel to talk about mealworms and their company. Yes, thank you very much for this great, great talk so far. Uh, so Ben, I just discovered that I can click to, through my slides myself here with the button in the left so you don't have to click for me. Um, yeah, now we come from flies to beetles, actually, and uh, together with my Marcel, um, uh, with my colleague Marcel, um, I will introduce you to my company Seprico and also to Mealworm Biology. Um, yeah, who are we? Um, Seprico is basically a joint venture between the Swiss insect farm Insectable, producing um, insects for basically mealworms for human feed and bioquality, uh, and also a chip. Yeah, Bernd, you still have to click, Lucas, what you have down, uh, down below is, let's say, your own slides, so not everyone can ah, see okay. that, just for clarification. Oh, okay. okay, please go ahead, sorry. sorry. Uh, then we need the next slide, slide uh, yeah. Oh, no, a prior slide, sorry. My fault. Um, so, uh, joint venture between Insectable Swiss Insect Farm, uh, then Sancti Bullet, a premium horse feed manufacturer in Germany, and uh, SEPRI, it's a project of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which was founded by my colleague Marcel and me. Um, next slide, please. At Seprico, we will cover basically the, the whole value creation process from uh, creating mealworm feed until the commercialization of uh, pet food and human food. From mealworms and also of course the breeding of mealworms at the moment we are building a pilot farm in germany which is basically for testing our own technological innovations and will also serve in the future as a blueprint for bigger farms 
We really believe in open innovation, and uh, that's why we help other insect farms uh, and transfer our, know our know how in the form of hardware, maybe in the future also software, and of course, professional advice. Next slide, please. Now I'll give you a brief introduction about the biology of the mealworm. As uh, Fabiola already said with silkworms, it's basically the same with mealworms. There are actually no worms, but they are the larvae of beetles. And uh, the, the flower beetle basically have two sexes. So there's a male beetle and a female beetle. They are spread all over the world, basically. And um, they love uh, the temperature at 28 degrees and 60% relative humidity but they also can survive at lower temperatures. Um, as you see, this is a holo metabol um, life cycle. As already Fabiola told you, there are hemi metabol life cycles and holo metabol ones. So basically you have here eggs, larvae, pupae, and then the adult beetles. Next slide. Uh, the mealworms are, the composition of mealworms is basically 65% uh, water and 35% uh, dry mass. And from the dry mass, basically half of that is proteins, one third of that is fat, and the rest is fiber, carbohydrates, and minerals. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. Um, what is really interesting about the mealworm is that they can be used to um, to basically upcycle side streams from agriculture and food production. And in contrast to the black soldier fly, they really like dry um, substrates. Um, one standard feed, for instance, is wheat bran, and uh, as a moisture source, you can use carrots. And they can upcycle this into high-value animal proteins, which can be used for, for pet food and human uh, food, of course. Next slide. Yeah, the life cycle of, uh, of, uh, of, of the mealworm takes around 10 to 12 weeks, and in an industrial setting, it is um, split into a reproduction process where um, the beetles are produced and they produce eggs. The eggs are then transferred in a fattening process where small larvae hatch from the eggs and they are fed until they reach a harvestable weight, which is around 100, 150 milligrams per larvae. And uh, yet yeah, they can be harvested and uh, inactivated and processed further. Next slide, please. Uh, Surprise, uh, less. Uh, so the reproduction process basically starts with um, um, yeah, grown-up larvae. They begin to pupate, and the pupate take around uh, one week to develop into beetles. And then the beetles uh, can be transferred to boxes. Next slide, please, Ben. Um, can be transferred to boxes, basically the same units uh, used for, for the fattening of the larvae. And then they immediately start to reproduce. And the female beetles then lay their eggs into the substrate. It's basically the same substrate, which is used as a feeding substrate for the larvae. And um, yeah, the, the uh, female beetles um, lay their eggs into the substrate, which is called oviposition. They have also ovipositor, um, which they they sting basically into the substrate and lay their eggs. And then you have two possibilities actually. You can either harvest the eggs and count them. So you can really portion the exact amount of eggs into your fattening units, or you can basically use the uh, the whole substrate with together with the eggs and transfer directly to the fattening process. Um, at the moment, most of the insect farms we know use the second process, so to transfer directly um, substrate with eggs into the fattening process. I also listed some parameters here. Sorry, prior prior um, slide, Ben. Uh, some parameters here, which might, which are important factors in the reproduction process, like the beetle age, the stocking density, of course, the sex ratio. We are at the moment developing a machine to uh, basically sex uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 beetles, so to, to to determine whether they are female and male, and then you can adapt the sex ratio for the optimal reproduction. Yeah, there are a lot of other parameters um, which are important and a lot of work to be done to optimize reproduction, I think. Next slide. I simplified the reproduction in some kind of formula under optimal conditions. So to get 140,000 eggs, you basically need 800 grams of um, beetles. 
and of course you need some time and uh, these 800 grams of beetles are derived from 1.2 kilograms of larvae so in the biomass you you lose some uh, yeah some weight due to for instance water loss and uh, also uh, some kind of uh, mortality in this process and that's some kind of formulation for an optimal um, reproduction next slide please so the as i already told you the eggs are then transferred into the fattening process so the eggs lie there in the feeding substrate then the larvae hatch they're really small about uh, uh, three millimeters long and are, um, are whitish in their appearance uh, I think in the Netherlands, they are also called glassworms because of this appearance. Um, then they immediately start to feed on the substrate. Um, so in our case, we, for instance, use uh, side streams from the milling process of our partner, St. Um, so So are basically side streams from the horse feed production. Then the larvae begin to fed on this substrate. And um, yeah, after uh, around 10 weeks, they reach the harvest rate. Basically, all of the substrate is converted to insect grass, which is a super organic fertilizer. And then you can harvest the larvae and uh, yeah, start the processing. Next slide, please. Also for this process, um, there is some kind of a, a, a fattening for, formula, basically. So you need around 2.2 kilograms of feed and 10,000 eggs. And after eight to 10 weeks with a little bit of moisture, you get one kilograms of mealworms. Um, next slide. Now I will hand over to my colleague Marcel, which uh, will tell you a bit more about the insect technology we use and insect farms in general. Thank you very much. Yeah, so like already uh, mentioned in the beginning, a uh, major part of what we do is actually developing and also building several technical solutions for the before mentioned reproduction process and also for the fattening process for uh, most uh, mealworm farmers that start from the ground up with uh, manual labor processes the first step into automatization is oftentimes the sorting of the different life stages of the mealworm as well as the separation from the larvae from their fresh during the harvesting process the machine which you can see here uh, in the pictures actually one of our first machines that we built, for example, to separate the pupae stage from the larvae stage, uh, as well as the larvae and pupae from the fresh. Uh, in general, we build different machinery and technology based on uh, vibration sieving, which would be the machine which you can see in the picture. Uh, but we are also uh, developing currently a technology with air sifting, uh, yeah, to separate also all life stages, the fresh, uh, but also live uh, insects from dead ones. At the moment, we are also developing processes. Oh, sorry, one step back, but it, yeah. So we are also developing uh, like machinery and technology uh, for a standardized uh, inactivation or killing process, drying processes, as well as a milling process of the insects. Uh, so at the end, you can have. Uh, like standardized uh, product. Uh, but of course, we understand that besides the standardized solutions, there's also, especially in the smaller farms, or if you're starting from the ground up, like I said, and don't have like millions of dollars or uh, euros to invest, we understand that oftentimes there's custom solutions that need to be made. So we're also open for that. So if you have any like specific out of the ordinary uh, requests we are also happy uh, to help out, with, uh, help out with that next slide please so there are different uh, sizes of insect farms as you can imagine and of course every size of insect farms comes with their own challenges that need to be overcome the starting point uh, for like you basically maybe as a new mealworm farmer is basically just the initial investment that you're willing to make so of course the more money you spend the bigger the insect farm can get right from the beginning uh, but uh, let's say you start uh, with uh, like not that much uh, in the small in this with a smaller amount of money uh, you would most probably start with an uh, insect farm a mealworm farm that looks uh, like something that is depicted on the left here like it's a small manual labor insect farm this one for example uh, can produce roughly around 500 kilograms of live uh, mealworms per month and yeah, like I said, it's where most people probably uh, will start. 
Uh, in the middle, you would have an insect farm that has, for example, an automated storage solution already. So the robot you can see here in the middle will automatically uh, retrieve and also put the insect crates into the fattening process. So they can, uh, so yeah, the called uh, storage department basically is automated here. Uh, what you can see on the right is uh, currently only a CGI picture, but maybe some of you know the frost uh, newborn producer insect. It's one of the you know, maybe largest or maybe the largest insect producer uh, currently in the world or at least in Europe, definitely. And they're building their new uh, gigantic insect farm uh, currently in uh, frost. In general, of course, the bigger your insect farm gets, the more processes you have to automate or you should automate, of course, to keep up with the work and also to keep the cost structure uh, yeah, like streamlined, keep the cost uh, low. Next slide, please. Yeah, so at the moment, uh, the on the left side, the four depictured uh, insect species are already allowed for human consumption in the EU. So the buffalo worm and the mealworm, they share very uh, similar uh, biology and therefore do not differ too much in their life cycle. The locusts and house crickets, on the other hand, have uh, very different demands to their habitat compared to a uh, mealworm and uh, the buffalo worm. But uh, what they all do have in common is that they all taste great. So <laughs> uh, yeah, next one, please. And if we're talking about great taste, uh, all of the mentioned insects can be processed into, of course, a wide variety of food products. Uh, here you can see some examples from our Swiss partner, Asento, who is already producing uh, meat alternatives as well as protein bars and uh, also whole insect snacks for the brave ones of you who are not afraid uh, to eat them in a like a, a, a raw state and not processed into a powder or uh, into a burger patty, for example. Yeah, so if you're interested in uh, insect farming technologies or have questions in general regarding the breeding and processing of the mealworms, or you're interested in a custom solutions for your insect farms, uh, you are free to contact us through our website or the short email address, and we would be uh, very happy to hear from you. So thank you very much. Okay, so I will hand over to Artur, uh, who will be talking about uh, the project approach, how uh, the distribution of CapEx and OpEx will look like, and we'll walk you briefly through. Um, we are slightly behind schedule, um, so um, we will uh, extend uh, the session um, maybe uh, about 10 minutes, so uh, we don't have to rush up uh, through the topics and find enough time to go through the questions uh, that came up in the meantime. So we'll hand over to Artur and uh, say thank you again to Marcel and Lucas for the presentation. Um, Artur, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Bernd. So as you mentioned, we are behind, uh, but hopefully we will manage to catch up a little bit and but still have enough time to, to go through the Q&As and also to um, yeah, give you some solutions on the CapEx and OpEx topics since uh, like Fabiola, uh, Heinrich, Marcel and Lukas have explained us. There are multiple species, there are multiple project approaches and at the end of the day we are all asking ourselves, well, sounds good. But how about the cost structures? How about the economical aspects? And this is something that I would like to cover on a on a high level since I don't have that much time. And then obviously uh, it is extremely individual. And therefore the idea here is basically to give you an overview on how to get to this cost. So what is the, the roadmap uh, in order to get there? Um, what, what is the let's say, um, example composition of the cost to get a first um, first feeling about that. Uh, and then also to, let's say, summarize where, where to get these numbers from, um, how to uh, treat certain assumptions, etc. So basically, um, starting with this uh, with this this topic, what we need to do in order to get to realistic numbers that are uh, essential part of a potential business plan is we need to do some some planning that sounds boring uh, at, at the first stage but unfortunately it is uh, it is necessary and in order to kick off the planning process there are some high level questions that have to be answered so ideally we have some let's say constraints available it is great uh, to to be able to to have the full freedom 
all the planning. Uh, but nevertheless, it's the uh, uh, band. Could you please go back? Okay, very good. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, we need to to have some, let's say, a planning constraint. So that means at some point uh, we we have to identify. Okay, this is the the total available budget that we would like to spend, or we have an existing building. It's a brownfield project. We go ahead with that, or we have a greenfield project, and we have a nice green field with uh, certain measures, and we try to squeeze everything uh, onto that uh, plot. Um, so this is an initial starting point. Ideally, we have multiple constraints. That really helps because too many degrees of freedom are not always helpful. So based on that, we go ahead uh, and start to, to plan the process itself. So this is done by a simple process block diagram, but as we have learned in, in the previous talks, uh, there are some, some variations. So whether we, we get uh, um, external products like, like, uh, like the reproduction uh, or whether we do everything in-house, everything reflects in the process block diagram. Based on that, we can go ahead and um, also calculate the exact flows. So we know what goes in, what goes out. Uh, this is a great starting point. So we know exactly how much we have to pay for things that go in and how much we can charge for things that go out. So to close the loop here, obviously revenue is also uh, important, but we will speak about that uh, um, in another uh, webinar series. And then we go into detail. So we start to, um, to do 3D models, machinery list, all the utilities, uh, and then the PNIDs. And then at the end of the day, we will have document specification books that we can link to potential suppliers and these uh, suppliers, they are able to uh, hand us uh, pricing and with this pricing, we can complete our model. So Bernd, can you please jump to the next slide? All right, so since we have learned uh, in order how to, let's say, get to, to a first idea, a model, now, what are, let's say, the major CapEx things to consider? So some things might be very obvious, other things might not be that obvious. So starting um, starting basically with the civil engineering, which has nothing to do with mechanical engineering, process engineering or biology. So that's, uh, uh, that's something that is essential anyway, since I need to, to put it somewhere. Uh, so we've seen that nice picture from from Heinrich uh, with, the, uh, with the with the green yard. So uh, this will not work in an industrial uh, environment. So we we need some kind of housing, and that housing obviously has a price tag. Uh, this price tag will strongly depend on uh, whether it's a brownfield project, whether it's a greenfield project, uh, how the constellation looks like. But as you can see in, in the diagram, uh, it is a relatively big uh, big part of the of the total cake. So this this includes everything from um, from planning, uh, buying uh, buying the plot, um, building the uh, the premises itself. Um, Bernd, back please. Um, so be besides the the civil uh, engineering, uh, there is also um, a certain planning that has to be uh, has to be done. So this also includes uh, the, the civil uh, engineering planning. Uh, we need to to get the machinery. Uh, we need to install um, units for the utilities like electricity, heat, water, wastewater, whatever is needed. Um, things that are really important in this constellation is a uh, topic of automation. And then we have, let's say, some, some general costs. But to su summarize here, you can see that most of the capex will go for the machinery. There will be a big, uh, big part of the cake will go for, for the civil engineering um, or the, the civil planning. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we, we have um, other smaller types, but th these are the major costs uh, um, uh, to consider. And next slide, please, Bernd. All right, so how does it look from, from the OPEX uh, side? So as I mentioned, uh, if we, we go, go ahead, we create uh, the press, uh, process flow diagram. Uh, we get a good understanding of what goes in in such a plant and what goes out. Um, so normally, about we are again at the capex side yeah very good thank you um so what goes in and what goes out so um for for the opex the substrate is a really essential uh, point so this strongly depends on what kind of substrates are available if they are declared as waste streams so we learned that there are certain limitations to that um, or whether it's let's say a valuable feed that could go into other industries um, as well 
Um, so this is this is something uh, that, that needs to be considered. Um, so we have the climatization uh, in general. Um, so this is also a, a major block and then obviously it depends whether the plant is located in, in Portugal, whether it is uh, located in, in other areas, uh, which might be a little bit colder. Um, so we have the electricity uh, utilities uh, like, like water, uh, the labor, the employees and uh, some some maintenance. Um, so the, these are, let's say, the major topics and what we've seen from previous projects, the main um, uh, the main things to highlight is really the topic of the substrate and the climatization. So if we go for a decentralized model, that then obviously we have to uh, see um, the cost structure for for the for the reproduction. Uh, but let's assume that that we will have an A to Z uh, installation. Then th these are really the things that uh, that you need to to concentrate on. Uh, next slide, please, Bernd. All right. So the question is: Well, now we know how to uh, yeah how to approach such a project. We have an overview about the the major capex and the opex, and now the question is: Well, how do we get to these uh, numbers? Since uh, there was not a single number in that uh, in that uh, presentation yet. So basically, it's pretty straightforward at some points. Uh, so that means uh, if we take the example of substrates, um, a certain substrate source um, has to be found, and then uh, you need to get these these numbers for the amount of substrate that is uh, needed. Um, for other things like annual salary, depending where you are, there are databases available. Energy costs, even though they are pretty uh, they are fluctuating a lot in the last time, but nevertheless, um, a certain assumption uh, has to be made in this regard. And then you can obviously get quotes from uh, from suppliers. Uh, you can reach out to uh, to parties that are um, that are working in the field of uh, consulting, engineering, etc. Um, so then, obviously, there are also other players uh, in the market. Like um, yeah, supply uh, like the suppliers or other producers in general, they can provide with information. Since, uh, as you can see by, by all these events, uh, it's uh, it's open-minded. So uh, the the idea is to share as much information as possible to uh, uh, to help the industry in general, and then. And for the civil engineering, we have the architects, and then on the other end, we also have market reports. But there, I would be cautious, so always ask for for samples first, in order to check if the information is is uh, valuable and we will help you at the end of the day. Next slide, Bernd, please. All right, and to quickly wrap it up, um, we need to do some pre-planning since uh, the question how much will it cost. It's tough to answer and. Uh, Every answer it will be uh, a complete failure because it will not not cover everything or the interfaces are not where they're supposed to be. Um, it's always good to exchange to uh, to to speak to to other stakeholders uh, to to get an idea. Review databases um, when you find them, regardless whether it's for uh, for the utilities, for labor, whether it's uh, pricing for the insect products, whether it's uh, for for the substrate that that goes in. Um, regarding the assumptions, so um, Excel will always do a great job in, in calculating, but uh, be, be sure that your assumptions are um, accurate. So look for multiple sources, uh, because at the end of the day, if you will reach out to partners, to investors, they will ask you, well, looks good. Where do these numbers come from? Uh, are they validated? Do you have any other sources? So here we speak of risk mitigation. That is really essential. Um, then at the end of the day, um, the numbers of CapEx and OpEx are, are not helping us uh, if we don't know the revenue. But as I mentioned, we will have that as a topic as well uh, in our webinar series. And uh, last but not least, I would highly uh, encourage you to, uh, to have a look at our other upcoming webinar series to, to learn more since uh, we have now learned about uh, the basics of the insects. We have really um, briefly touched the, the economical aspects and I'm pretty sure that there will be many, many other interesting things that you will learn. So please feel free to join the other webinars. Feel free to share it in your network. We are very happy to, to share our know-how and I think that was the last point in my presentation. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, 
very good insight and um, I think there will be a lot of questions coming up, maybe not instantly, but definitely through our channels and through our website. And as um, you mentioned, we will be digging deeper in all those topics uh, in the upcoming webinars. I'm seeing a lot of applause, so thank you very much. We will jump and actually we are already more or less um, uh, using uh, our planned time frame, but I would like to add another 10 minutes for questions and answers. And I would directly jump in um, for any question and answers. Um, you are free to uh, follow up uh, if your questions are not answered or you have questions coming up when you review the presentation or rehear the presentation. Feel free to contact us. And I think the major way and the best way uh, when we have up the, 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 the website up and running next week with the forum, uh, we'll try to get those questions and answers into the forum. And so you can start the discussion and get not only only uh, experts view and replies from the people uh, attending this webinar, but from the whole community. OK, let's jump right into it. Um, I will start off um, from the first question from Geert. Uh, I hope I pronounce your name right, Verheyen. Um, he says, I hear something different arguments that insects can be given manure, e.g. if they are used for specific applications like generating infertile flies. Others say that is never allowed to feed insects with manure regardless uh, of downstream application. What is the view on this? I think that would be a question for Heinrich. I think uh, yeah. you are closest to legislation, uh, at least for Europe. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this question. Yeah, we, we have um, uh, the legislation uh, uh, divided in two parts. We have the downstream uh, and the upstream. Downstream means um, what to which um, um, animals we can feed our product, our processed animal protein, our fat. Um, and then the upstream is the question, what can we feed to the insects? And there the animal byproduct legislation come into uh, its place. And there it, it is written, if uh, an animal is reared for a purpose, it's a farmed animal. So purpose and purpose is general. So even you don't go in downstream to the, uh, to the feeding part, to do, you probably uh, do technical products out of it. For example, from, from the oil, you can uh, produce uh, diesel or biosurfactants or lubricants, whatever. Uh, that's totally separated. It's still a farmed animal. And so you are only allowed to uh, provide uh, according to feeding ca uh, catalog, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the substrates which, which are also allowed for other farmed animals like pigs. We from EPF, we are working on, on that. And, and the next step is uh, that we are allowed uh, to use former foodstuff, uh, uh, including uh, fish and, um, and, and meat. Uh, my example uh, is you actually you are allowed to feed pizza margarita, but you are not allowed to feed pizza salami, period. No discussion. Uh, faces and uh, uh, that is, is uh, a discussion we may start in five years from now. Right now, we are talking about uh, meat. The actual situation is we have to prove that if we, for example, feed a salami, which is pig derived, and then in the pub, we don't find any pig uh, processed animal proteins anymore. Because otherwise, uh, because of cannibalism, we cannot feed it to pig again. Yeah? There are then two approaches uh, in future. Maybe if you uh, detect um, a, a pig uh, peak in, in, the, uh, in detecting, you have to separate that and only feed to, to poultry. But that will complicate uh, things a lot. We are working together with the European uh, labs, especially the, the one in Wallonie, <clears throat> the, the, um, uh, um, the, the European uh, lab for, for such uh, things. And we hope we get the uh, answer soon and uh, are in close contact. But again, right now, only approved feeding stuff is allowed in Europe. 
Okay, thank you very much, Heinrich. Um, that's the European point of view. I think uh, I think uh, in other continents and countries, uh, different legislation will apply. And, um, and further question, Anupa Kuwai, um, BSF is asking, um, amino acid profiles, profile is determined by genetics. We were in the impression that it is based on the feed for BS black soldier flies. Please elaborate on this. And second, how feed and genetics influence fatty acid profiles? Might be a question for Fabiola or for Heinrich. I'm, I'm, I think I'm the specialist for BSF, but uh, Fabiola okay. may, uh, may add this. Right. Then. Um, we have made uh, uh, more than uh, we have made more than uh, 500 uh, feeding trials by now, and we couldn't uh, see a, a change in uh, the uh, amino acid profile. It's only, uh, let's say, measurement uh, di differences. So um, I would be glad if somebody comes up and see I have a certain diet and we can improve methionine because it's much harder to uh, go via rearing and, and get the methionine uh, por portion up. So this is um, so we are pretty much convinced that uh, amino acid uh, profile is determined uh, uh, by the, the genetics. That's what you see as well as at, at other uh, animals. However, the fatty acid profile you can um, influence uh, with what you feed. Um, if you uh, feed more uh, fatty portions, then uh, the, the portion of fatty as, uh, acids go, goes up. And also there is um, um, yeah, uh, uh, a shift between the different fatty acids. We have a lot of uh, C12 which is the lauric acid uh, and the C16 um, uh, palmitic uh, acid. And there is a, a, a shift uh, between them and you can influence that uh, with the feeding. Yeah, okay. I, I can agree with uh, Heinrich on that. Uh, nothing much to add. Only like one example. Um, for example, in the form, um, the methionine uh, content is quite high. So actually every insect species has their distinct uh, nutritional profile. And as Heinrich said, uh, the amino acid profile is pretty much determined by genetics, as far as we know. Um, yeah, the fatty acid profile and also uh, very much the total amount of fat is uh, determined uh, also by the nutrition. And it's a bit the same with us humans. So uh, we can influence uh, our fat content, so to say, by our nutrition and uh, how much what we do. And that's also true for insects. Thank you, Fabiola. Um, next question, and I would suggest we will cover another two, three questions, then we need to wrap up. Um, the question is coming from Joseph Odumla. Um, he is asking in poultry, if you are considering layer birds, is it necessary to mix the black soldier fly with other feed ingredients or does black, so black soldier fly contain a mix of all vital ingredients to formulate a complete feed? I think again, uh, Heinrich. Yeah, okay. Very often such questions are asked to me. Uh, my answer then is always I'm a specialist in insects and until I provide the, the product, I can answer. The, uh, uh, the feeding of poultry and other is a, a special uh, science. And um, so I, I have only very uh, high level uh, knowledge about this. However, there are a lot of uh, feeding trials with uh, insects, especially University of Göttingen, um, there, uh, um, uh, Dr. Felden and, and so on, Professor Liebert. There you can look in literature. But please understand, um, uh, uh, it's it's uh, this nutrition, this physiology of poultry, and so it's so complicated, and it's out um, uh, beyond my my uh, details knowledge. Maybe I can I can quick quickly add. So um, beside the biological aspects about digestion, nutrition, it's also an economical aspect since uh, uh, poultry is fed with uh, wheat that is relatively cheap. Um, so without commenting on why it is so so cheap, um, but um, 
basically you would uh, the objective here is to use as less black soldier fly as as possible as long as uh, the price tag is still higher than than what you uh, have to pay for other um, for other feed ingredients um, but nevertheless it's always uh, it's always interesting to see how let's say also a small um, a small percentage of black soldier fly can bring great great value to um, uh, to to the process or the, the the rearing of poultry in general, and uh, if you also f fed them alive, it will also uh, benefit to the uh, yeah to the welfare of the chicken um, as well. Since you know ca catching the worms is a bit more funny than just just picking at a at a central place. I think to add as well, as, um, it's depending if you're talking really in industrial production, then selling the proteins and and and, and insects for feeding the the, the chicken or whether you are we talking maybe about other continents other use cases where you basically produce locally uh, the the insects uh, you have no trying process and things like that and feed it directly to the chicken the picture may look different um another question um and we have really um, a, a key focus on black soldier fly i'm pretty pretty surprised or not that surprised because black soldier fly is the dominating species currently regarding the hybrid model uh, rearing uh, black soldier fly wouldn't be a problem to maintain the same quality of the end products. I mean, if you have an interhouse strain accustomed to your own feedstock and uh, the other parts come from outer on uh, outer and source, would wouldn't be a problem to maintain a consistent quality. How can this be avoided? Can this be a problem? Yeah, maybe I can. I can. Start or no, I like, would you like to go ahead? Hmm. Okay, Arthur, or who, who will? Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe I can to do some some first first words. Um, yeah, so that that will definitely be be a challenge. Um, at least from from the process side, um, so since we know that uh, the the end result will will be different. So the question is, will that difference be you know influencing uh, influencing the um, um, let's say the, the sales process, uh, the, the quality uh, assurance, etc. So obviously, for for such a complex process, ideally you have um, consistent input and you will gain consistent output. But what we know from the black soldier fly industry in general, um, since it's let's say organic, the substrates will fluctuate. Um, we always have to take into account that there will be always some some variation. The question is, are we able to handle that variation? And the key. Uh, key to to handle this this variation, regardless whether it's a big or small variation, is to uh, to, to really be uh, ahead of the processes to to get all uh, to get all relevant data, and let's say also try to predict what what will happen. Um, so and then at the end of the day, ba based on that data, so there are multiple models from processing, let's say, or uh, production lines from multiple other industries. As long as you have data, then then you will be able to, let's say, handle it in in, in a certain way. And okay, um, uh, Arthur, I a little bit have to um, correct you. Um, uh, let, let me. Um, we we don't uh, uh, see uh, or in uh, there is out uh, word of mouth that you if you rear uh, black soldier on the same substrate in the third generation, you have better results. But that's by now not true. Uh, by now, what we see, people are starting real black soldier fly, and then they are getting better. Then and, and then uh, there is the learning curve. So you cannot direct uh, on that, uh, that that the larvae is uh, 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 adjusting itself to the substrate. So uh, uh, how would that work? You know, how can a, a, a adult fly give this information further to this? this is so totally separated. We have to do more research on that, but I, I doubt that because there are other influences how you get better. You are correct in, in um, that the end product uh, is um, fluctuating, is, is vol volatile. We are in a natural product and we have to learn much more uh, to, to get the, the parameters closer and to get a more consistent end uh, product. And also having, for example, uh, different uh, lead times, different cycle times, normally the the suspended neonates are one to three days uh, faster. So you have to, to do your logistics in that that uh, that uh, uh, in 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 your hybrid uh, model. But uh, from 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 the 
uh, the uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, I, I discuss that always, and if and recently also a, a professor uh, came up and said, yeah, uh, there is, and I say, where is the where is the the, the, the evidence that uh, reared on the same substrate the, the larvae improve? And they said, ah, I heard uh, about this. Yeah. So we have to to ask twice in that direction, and we need to get more into that uh, detail that the larvae adapt to the to the substrate. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we have quite some more questions remaining and we are running out of time. Uh, so what we will do, we will capture, as I said, the questions and uh, provide the answers uh, uh, as soon as we have the website up. So uh, please bear with us uh, a couple of days and uh, you will get the questions and you may still be able to ask further questions. So. Time to wrap up, time to, uh, time to say goodbye. And uh, first of all, thanks again uh, for the presenters. I think we had uh, quite some interesting topics. We had, uh, I think uh, as well, some valuable content to get started. Please keep in mind, this is the basic seminar. So we will dig down furthermore in, in depth to, to, to drill down and get more information for you ready. Um, what we will do as well, um, as already mentioned, we will send out the presentation and the, the, the recording from the webinar. Uh, we will just do some, let's say, preparation and cleaning up and, and things like that. So everybody who is registered, not even just the participants, but uh, already uh, everybody who is registered will get the webinar regardless in which webinar he is registered in. So we'll distribute it, uh, the whole community. Uh, just to give you some figures, we had uh, over 600 registrations, so uh, we will get quite some reach uh, with that. Um, if you have further questions um, uh, on the presentation or on the website, you will uh, see the contact information uh, on the presentation. Each of the presenters uh, have uh, given you contact information as well, so feel free to contact everybody directly. Uh, you don't have to go through us, uh, but of course we will be happy if you need help, support, whatever um, we can orchestrate. And we have more people and experts in our network, so we can help you uh, to get uh, up to speed or to get uh, more traction in your projects. Um, what else? Um, I will send out uh, as well the questionnaire um, because for us your feedback is valuable. Uh, we would like to improve, get even better and um, provide a, a better, let's say, a quality and even a higher quality than we had uh, provided so far. And I think uh, it's already really, really good. And uh, I was impressed about uh, the presenters and everybody participating here. Um, so um, it remains for me um, that uh, the next webinar is on March 31st. Uh, that will be definitely be more on the biology, rearing and reproduction. So uh, you will be uh, very much invited to participate. If you have not registered for the upcoming uh, webinars, please do so and uh, we will keep you posted. So. Um, it's the end of the week and I can wish everybody uh, a nice weekend and uh, I enjoyed very much and we enjoyed as Interconnect your participation and we hope we can start now a uh, living discussion, a living community and uh, provide a lot of value to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.